You're watching Play Unplugged TV. Unplugged.com, and I'm joined by Brian Stiltz of Reaper Miniatures. Say hi, Brian. Hi. It's so great to have Reaper Miniatures here at Origins. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story, if you don't mind. Sure. One of the we on our podcast, we sometimes talk about what we like to talk about things that help gamers have better experiences gaming. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, my freelance, one of my freelance writers, Scott Pyle. We're big role players, but we love playing role playing games that involve miniatures. We like, we're very visual people. We like to move the miniatures around. And actually, one of our favorite ways to make characters is to go down the racks of miniatures, pick out a person, and say, Oh, that's the guy I want to paint. I'm going to make up my story about him. And I can't tell you how useful Reaper miniatures have been with that style of character making. Well, that's great. Uh, I actually uh, do a lot of at, at shows. People come up to me and they describe their character. and a lot of what I do is I help them locate exactly the mini. Uh, we have over 3,500 miniatures in our catalog and we generally bring between 800 and 1,000 of those to any given show. So chances are really good that we've got something that, that adequately represents what it is you need. So it's I mean, it's, uh, just looking at any issue of Casket Works would tell you it's an unbelievable catalog mm -hmm. of miniatures. You know, that, that actually would bring a great segue to a question. How do you guys manage all those different sculpts? Um, we keep everything sorted by number, uh, and the computer manages all of the inventory. Um, a lot of what I do in the factory is my job is to go through the spreadsheets and the files and the databases and uh, correlate all the data of what's on order, you know, what we need. And, and uh, the computer, once, once I've input all the data, the computer comes back and gives the report of what needs to be made. Um, but everything boils down to keeping everything clearly labeled, all the, all the boxes we cast into, all the molds are clearly labeled, uh, and the paperwork is all very clearly labeled with both the part number and we usually include the figure's name uh, because not everybody at the factory, even though we, we go by part number back at the shop, uh, you still, you know that, you know, 2510 is Balto Burrowell because you're constantly seeing the name side by side with the number all day long. Uh, so, so one of the keys then is the key to success being very organized. Extremely organized, yeah. Like I said, we have over 3,000 miniatures, uh, 3,500, and uh, when you combine the parts, like the wing for the dragon is a separate part number than the body and gets cast at a separate time, um, we have over 6,000 individual components that make up those 3,500 miniatures. And a lot of, a lot of really well-known and fantastic sculptors, too. Yeah, uh, we our our sculpting pool is is a dozen or so of the most talented sculptors in the industry, um, and we've got everybody: Sandra Garrity, Bobby Jackson, Werner Clock, Gene Van Horn, uh, Jason Wiebe, Bob Rodolfi, Julie Guthrie. You know, uh, Bob, Julie, and, and Sandy were working way back in the Ralph Partha days when when they were the the number one uh, contender in the industry. So. Now, one another thing with uh, being a being you know a player also, not just a, a person who does games journalism, being a being a very into it fan, um, building a dungeon and populating that dungeon, even as a painter, as a person who loves to paint miniatures, it can be really difficult. And one of the things is when when D and D minis kind of you know had to go away, went away. Um, you know, you guys stepped in and you have this really wonderful line that's that's slowly growing. So tell us, what's what's coming up in the future of, of Asylum Miniatures and, and the pre-painted plastics? Uh, well, I know that uh, later this year, Asylum Miniatures is going to do a Cerberus, and I believe we're going to do... I know there's a wolf on the horizon because there's always a need for wolves and wargs and that kind of thing. Um, to be honest, off the top of my head, I don't know the full uh, upcoming lineup. Uh, but that's something that we launched several years ago, and uh, our idea was we wanted non-blind, non non-random. We want you to be able to walk into the store and go, I need goblins for tonight's game, walk over to the shelf and know you're getting a goblin, not have to buy six or seven packs and hope that you've got goblins in there. So. Yeah, and that is, um, it, that, that's a huge boon, I think, to GMs everywhere because you're really... the. The blind purchase is difficult. Yeah, uh, well, it, and it's especially problematic when you have uh, an urgent game need. If you're just randomly into collecting, then the random thing works just fine. Um, but ours is really designed for you know you have a game coming up, so we've really focused on uh, monsters, and we're trying to go primarily at the beginning anyway uh, with monsters that we know you need lots of, with the goblins, the kobolds, the orcs, the skeletons. Um, we've got. Ogres and trolls and minotaurs and that in there as well. Spiders, 
um, and then fairly generic human fighters and in uh, plate mail, elf archers, dwarf fighters, things like that, so that we fill out that very basic rounded portion of what you need. Like I said, wolves are coming up. We just did some rats. Um, I wish I could remember. Oh, we've got a, a fire beetle coming up. So. We we actually just oh, we actually just reviewed the knoll and the rats, and I felt like the paint jobs were really solid. And I feel like for the most part, I mean, like obviously pre-painted, the paint jobs are maybe not going to be always as good as when you do it yourself, but they're very serviceable. Like, how do you guys maintain quality control on that? Um, we have the original masters are, are painted by our staff painter and forester, and uh, we send those to the company that that does the actual manufacturing for us. And we make sure that Ann puts on it a very clean job. We've learned over the past, we've been doing these for four years now, actually. And we've learned in the last four years with some good paint jobs that we've sent over and some bad paint jobs that, that we've gotten back, uh, what they're capable of replicating easily. And so we're very careful when we paint a new figure or, or send a figure over for a second iteration of its paint job. Uh, we've, we've learned how to be very careful about making sure that the designs we put on it and the color choices we use uh, our choices that are easy for them to replicate with their process and that enables us to keep a high level of quality going coming back from them nice nice um now i understand that reapers kind of it's it's metamorphosized now it's got like there's an overarching name now hobby q which kind of encompasses reaper but it also encompasses asylum can you talk a little bit about how that new structure has changed things around reaper uh well internally the only thing that changes is that every week when i take my check to the bank it says hobby q in the corner instead of reaper um, but ultimately what it boils down to is that uh, when we launched the uh, Legendary Encounters miniatures, we launched them under the Reaper brand. And for about two years, stores weren't buying them. They weren't picking them up really well. And it was because uh, nobody understood what we were, we were doing. They, they didn't understand that Reaper was now making pre-painted plastic figures. So we rebranded them as Asylum miniatures, and all of a sudden they took off. Everybody went, oh, well, Reaper makes metal figures. Asylum miniatures makes pre-painted plastic. Uh, and there was there was an additional impetus behind that. We uh, spent some time courting some of the mass market stores. Um, if you guys are probably familiar with uh, Hobby Lobby or Michaels and hobby stores like that, um, and they shied away from our brand. They liked our product, uh, but the paint was labeled Reaper Master Series, and they didn't like that Reaper on it. They didn't like the skull logo. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of pushed them. The mass market was a little afraid of that, so we decided to rebrand the paint as just Master Series paint. We took all the Reaper reference off of it. We actually made Master Series its own division, and so at that point you had Hobby Q as the parent company owning Reaper, which produces metal, high-quality metal figurines, uh, Master Series, uh, which produces high-quality paint, and Asylum Miniatures, which produces the high-quality pre-painted plastics. And so Hobby Q was just kind of a, an umbrella company that we could use uh, to help keep the brand separate and yet functioning under the same uh, management. Awesome, Brian. You know what? You just set me up with another perfect segue. I really appreciate that. So at the con I've seen, there's these new Master Series HD paints that you guys have released. Can you talk a little bit about like what, what went into that process and what, what was the idea? What are you hoping that consumers get out of it? Uh, well, there was a, a perception that our regular Master Series paint line, which has been out for, oh, eight years? No, not quite eight years. Um, five years. Six. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, somewhere between six and eight years. And uh, there was a perception that because of 216 colors deep and we marketed as triads for uh, base coat, uh, shadow, uh, mid-tone highlight, um, the perception that that was a, and because we call it Master Series, that it was for professional painters and that the beginning, uh, quote, amateur painter or, or somebody who's just painting for tabletop, that this wasn't a product designed for them. Um, so to overcome that, we developed the HD paints, which has a higher pigment density. That's what the HD is, is high density. Uh, higher, higher pigment density, basically, uh, we squirt two to three times as much pigment into any given gallon of the HDs as we do into the gallons of the, the Master Series core. Um, so they're better, better single coat coverage, better base coating. Um, but because they work off the same basis and the same pigment type, uh, it's, it's actually the same pigment, like the red is the same red pigment as in our, our Master Series core colors, just less quantity in the core color than in the, the HD. Um, so you would, you would base coat with the HD paint and then uh, the core colors lend themselves better to the blending, the washes and the shading applications, uh, uh, layering uh, some of the more advanced techniques. So it was really our idea was to overcome that stigma that 
this was for you know uh, the Jen Haley's and Derek Schubert's of the world that win the national competitions, and and that you as a an entry level consumer weren't weren't worthy of the paint, and so we we, we wanted to overcome that stigma. Well, I think it's good. I, I think that uh, more things that will bring new people into painting miniatures. I think the more things that break down those barriers, absolutely the better. Um, Brian, can you leave us with some thoughts about like what what's in the future for Reaper? What are some things that we should get really excited about that's coming up? Uh, well, we just launched here at the show, actually. We have the preview copies of the Savage Worlds miniatures. We just signed a, a licensing deal with them. So if you're familiar with the Savage Worlds role-playing game, they've been doing Deadlands for years. Um, we're, we just launched here the uh, Savage Worlds minis. We started that with the four iconic characters from the Deadlands universe. Uh, they've got fantastic artwork. Um, we continue to work with uh, the Paizo crew very closely. Uh, Lisa Stevens and Eric Mona, uh, Sean K. Reynolds, fantastic people over there. If you don't mind, fantastic line of miniatures too. Some really nice sculpts. I particularly love the goblins, great goblins. Very characterful, huge mouths jumping around, like just really great looking goblins. Yeah, well, Todd Walpole does the, the goblin art for them and he's a fantastic artist. And uh, that's a lot of what helps us get really good sculpts out of Pathfinder and the Savage Worlds is the artwork they're based on is just absolute top notch art. And uh, for years, Dark Heaven has had, we've had uh, Tim Collier as our staff artist, and he does some great pieces. And we can, you can definitely point to the best pieces in the line were the pieces that he drew the artwork for. Um, but you, you also get Dark Heaven takes a lot of, you know, Bobby Jackson sitting at home one day fiddling with the green stuff, and he puts together a mini that he thinks is cool. Then, then Dark Heaven will pick that up as well. But if you've got some really inspired, just gorgeous Wayne Reynolds concept art or some Todd Walpole art or something, you just get some fantastic things out of that. So uh, I look forward to seeing in uh, the Pathfinder line and the Savage World line some really uh, envelope-pushing, groundbreaking uh quality sculpts, some visually beautiful things to put on the table, to paint, to play games with. So Brian, this was very informative, and I'm getting excited about these new releases from Reaper, so I can't wait to see them. Thank you so much for the interview. All right, thank you.